Good morning. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. These are the stories that set your agenda. Stocks take a breather as traders begin to focus on NVIDIA earnings, an event set to test the AI-driven rally. The Fed's Loretta Mester and Rafael Bostic reaffirm the higher for longer mantra in exclusive interviews with Bloomberg. And not five years anymore. JP Morgan boss Jamie Dimon lights a fire under succession talk and America's biggest bank, signaling his retirement is closer than ever. Plus, NVIDIA and Dell discuss a new AI-powered partnership. We bring you our exclusive conversation with the company's CEOs. Let's check in on these markets then. European stocks, US stocks still close and near those record highs. You had very modest gains on Wall Street yesterday. But yes, Nvidia is expected to be that catalyst when it comes through, of course, with the earnings on Wednesday, US time towards the end of the day. And then, of course, here in the UK, the inflation data crossing earlier on Wednesday. Currently, the FTSE 100 futures pointing lower by six tenths of a percent. European stocks pointing to the losses of around three tenths of a percent. Commodities continues to be in focus. The Bloomberg Commodity spot index, by the way, yesterday reaching the highest levels since January of 2023. S&P futures currently flat, Nasdaq futures as well in similar territory at 18,752. Let's flip the board and look cross asset then. We have been hearing from Loretta Mester and Raphael Bostic reiterating essentially the higher for longer mantra. Loretta Mester saying that it is no longer Probably no longer appropriate to go for three cuts this year, as the dot plots have signalled, of course. More likely, it is appropriate to go for around two. And Bostic as well, suggesting that rates will be higher for longer. 4.43 on the benchmark 10-year, and that is the Bloomberg spot dollar uh, index as well. You're seeing modest gains for the Bloomberg dollar and for the dollar, I should say. And uh, as a result, a little bit of softness coming through for Asian FX. Bitcoin, interesting. ETF speculation when it comes to Ether, powering it close to those record highs of 71,000. Currently at 70,000. 842. Will Bitcoin break out of that range? Currently up 2% in the session. And copper, back below that 11,000 level, 10,808, down 7 tenths of a percent on, of course, the commodity that has rallied around 27, 28% so far year to date. We keep across the commodity story for you as well with that eye on copper. Let's cross over, though, to Asia now. Avril Hong standing by in Singapore. And Avril, it's been a tough day, it looks, for Hong Kong stocks, particularly those with a tech leaning. Yeah, it is looking pretty painful for those Chinese tech equities. But I wanted to talk you through what we're seeing big picture first because Asia stock gauge has snapped that multi-session winning streak well into negative territory. Remember how yesterday it was the materials sector that was leading the charge. Today is among the bottom performers as commodity prices come in a bit softer. As you say, we've seen that pain coming through for Hong Kong stocks, the Hang Seng well in negative territory. Uh, the declines also now being seen in a Japanese stock gauge despite gains earlier. Let's flip the board, talk about why. By the way, on the Hang Seng, I think it's the steepest drop in about a month. And this is no thanks to the earnings story. We got the likes of Lee Auto, the EV maker, sales miss, really showing how that intense competition in the Chinese EV market is biting. Don't forget we have Xpeng reporting today as well. Its stock also dragged. Now helping to cap the losses on the Japanese stock gauges, the insurers. Uh, many of them have reported and we had the likes of MSNAD showing how the earnings outlook is positive, announcing share buyback. So that's why you're seeing those double digit gains there. Samsung, another tech stock that we're keeping an eye on as it has announced that it's replacing the chief of its chips division, showing perhaps you know the moves <laughs> coming in amid the intense rivalry with its smaller rival, uh, SK High Flip the board. Let's take a look at the Hang Seng Tech. I want to show you how it's fared this year as it's recovered from those January lows, but it's still struggling to breach the 4,200 level, something we last saw in September last year. You really get the sense that given the declines in Lee Auto and Tencent a day, it'll really take the likes of NVIDIA to kind of spur things further along. Flip the board again. Let's take a look at bonds in Japan. Remember how we really saw that selling coming through across the curve yesterday. Even the 10-year was hitting levels we haven't seen since 2013 on those yields. A bit of a recovery today, but uh, you're still seeing that weakness on dollar yen. It's about the green bag, those higher U.S. yields against the backdrop of that Fed speak, I think, Tom. 
OK, Ava Hong in Singapore with a check on the Asian markets. A bit of a challenge day over in that region, at least. Thank you, Avril. Let's go to our exclusive Fed speak then. And, of course, Avril was touching on this. Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bostic has doubled down on the higher for longer mantra. Meanwhile, Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester says three rate cuts in 2024 are no longer appropriate. I was on the record uh, before saying I was at the median, which was three. The developments I've seen in the economy right now, I would not think that that's still appropriate um, because the inflation risks have moved up. Anything can happen. My outlook is really that inflation will continue to fall through this year and into 2025. You know, I think that it will take quite a while for us to get all the way to 2%, but, uh, but I do think we'll get there. OK, let's bring in Bloomberg MLI's Mark Cranfield then in Singapore. So, Mark, we heard there from Loretta Mester walking back from three to two on expectations around the number of cuts. In terms of the adjustments around the dot plots, the dot plots had signaled three, of course, this year. To what extent is that now history? What are traders looking for when it comes to those forecasts? Well, traders are looking for somewhere between one and two rate cuts by the end of the year, probably with a start in November. So the Fed meeting coming up in a couple of weeks' time is the one where they only review the dot plots every quarter. So June is the next time they will do that, and they will give us a new outlook. There's no way they can go with three cuts. There simply isn't enough time. We've already reached the middle of the year, and they were projecting this back in January when they thought that the rate cutting may start as soon as March. Well, clearly the CPI data has not worked out in their favour. There have been a couple of very hot prints, and they've had to dial back. That's why you're hearing this higher for longer mantra they've been repeating for some time. So here we are. Fed people are doing a mark to market. They've reached the middle of the year. They realize they, there's no chance of them doing three cuts. The question is now, do they do two or one? There will certainly be a decent mm. amount of relief in financial markets if they come through with two dot plots, because that would clearly show that they're going to try and squeeze in a couple before year end. What would not be quite so promising would be if they go for one. Market probably wouldn't like it too much. So, Mark, two to one is the question, or two or one. Which assets then, we're not going to get three. You've, you've made that pretty clear, in your estimation at least, in terms of the time frame. It's just not there. Which assets are most sensitive to a move from two to one in terms of expectations on the dot block? Certainly currencies and bonds are going to be right at the forefront of whatever comes out from the dot plot reaction. So... Um, if we get, if there's only one, that will hit the bond market pretty hard because you can see there's been a repricing. Yields are, are certainly a bit lower recently and the Treasury market would there'd be a decent sell off probably if we only saw one dot plot before the end of the year. And people will assume that would be December. So plenty of time to turn a bit bearish on bonds if that's the case. Equally, that the US dollar would respond very favorably, most likely to that. And dollar yen would be right in the forefront of that picture. We've seen it already. Every time yields pop up in America, it's, it's driven dollar yen, and that's how we got to 160 not too long ago. If it's two cuts seen before the end of the year, that will be a major relief. Probably see a bit of a bond rally. Dollar will probably come off across the globe, especially with emerging markets. There will be a big sigh of relief in the emerging world, and you see a few currencies do better there in Asia, probably Latin America, some of the Eastern Europeans as well. Equity markets probably don't mind too much either way because all they care about is NVIDIA this week. And if NVIDIA comes out and meets expectations, it's gangbusters again for equities regardless of what the Fed does. OK, Mark Cranfield from Bloomberg's M Live team on the sensitivity around global FX to the Fed and expectations around cuts. But again, a reminder of the importance of those NVIDIA earnings, of course, that cross on Wednesday. Thank you to the banking space now. And JP Morgan, uh, JP Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon, of course, saying the bank's succession plans our quote, well on the way. He says the timetable is not five years anymore after he was asked how long he would remain in charge. I um, have the energy that I've always had. That's important. I think when I can't put the jersey on and give it full thing, I should leave, you know, basically. Uh, the board probably, it's up to them at the time. Will I stay as chairman for a while? We'll see. Uh, but I think the mo and we're on the way. I mean, we're moving people around. 
OK, for more on this, let's bring in Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta, anchor, of course, of Markets Today show. Kriti, uh, we're well on the way, JP Morgan, uh, Jamie Dimon says. He's, he's long joked about the five-year time, time horizon for how long he's going to stay at the back. How, how seriously should we take He's 68 years old, so clearly it's the back of his mind. How positioned, how well positioned is, J, uh, is, is JP Morgan right now for a change of leadership? Well, some would argue that this has been in the works for a while. Remember back in 2021, he had already kind of reshuffled some of his uh, lieutenants, if you will, at the top of the banks. Uh, some key names here, Jen Pepsack, Troy Rob Rorba, Roar, 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 is how I'm going to say that right. Uh, I apologize to him and to the team for getting that one wrong. But uh, they have basically expanded the commercial investment bank. Remember, you're talking about a time when we've never really been in this kind of economic environment where deal flow has been under such volatility and until you really have the leadership kind of changing the game there, as well as their kind of uh, commercial banking as well. So Marianne Lake and uh, Jen Pepsack had initially co-run that part of the business. Then Jen moved to the investment bank side as well. Those are the kind of the three candidates to be put up for succession. Remember, one of the key pieces of this as well is that J.P. Morgan has never had a female CEO. So the fact that he has now promoted two to their lieutenant signals that there might be some sort of confidence, or some sort of move at least, that some of these senior women could potentially be in the running just as much as their male counterparts. And that is a really big deal when we talk about what is actually going to be leading J.P. Morgan into the, say, the next decade, for example. That's why this really matters. It's not necessarily the fact that the timeline is not five years anymore. It's about what part of the business is getting perhaps the most leadership, the most experience, and who's going to take the helm after. And he says he's likely to stay on the boards and he still has that energy to keep going, at least for now, to keep pulling on the jersey and getting, on, getting onto the pitch to play for J.P. Morgan. Um, when, it, when it comes to his, his, his kind of legacy, um, there's that aspect as well that maybe you can touch on. But also he hit back against regulators once again. It's not new from Jamie Dunn, but he has arguably been the most vocal of those bank leaders on that front. Yeah, and winning on the lobbying front when it comes to some of these stricter capital requirements. This is the Basel III endgame kind of policy that we're talking about. We're in the fallout of the SVB collapse, for example. You had a lot of people coming out and saying, well, maybe the banks need to be a little bit more cushioned, a little bit of kind of World War II, Great Depression kind of rhetoric in terms of really supporting the banks. Jamie Dimon saying, well, if you actually have more reserves, that means less lending capacity. It means higher credit standards. That actually hurts the entire economy. There was a number they put out on Monday that said two-thirds of consumers would maybe have to pay a monthly service fee for their checking accounts if the current proposals were implemented. That's how dire he's saying the situation is. And the fact that they were actually having reports over the weekend from the Wall Street Journal, for example, that those proposals are getting pulled back on Diamond and some of his colleagues kind of behest, that is a good sign. And I think that's indicative of the kind of influence, of course, that Jamie Diamond has, not only running the largest bank in the world, but also this idea that uh, he is very much someone who does get on the field and does get involved, not just when it comes to the policy, but even in terms of buybacks, which he also tempered expectations for in the investment. Yeah, and the, the stock dipped on, on, on that comment around the buyback story, didn't it? Kriti Gupta, thank you very much indeed. From our Markets Today team, of course, anchor looking at the JP Morgan story and, of course, the succession plans underway at that bank. Here's what else to be thinking about today. That's 7 a.m. UK time. It is the AGM, the annual general meeting, of course, of Shell will be tuning in for that. Any lines crossing, of course, for that oil and energy major. And later today, over in the emerging market space, you're going to get the rate decision, the central bank decision from Nigeria. We'll be getting that as well, bring you analysis on that story, of course. And in the U.S., earnings crossing from Macy's and Lowe's, so a touch point there on the health of the U.S. consumer. Those data points crossing later today in U.S. time. You can get a roundup, of course, of stories you need to know to get your day going. In today's edition of Daybreak, terminal subscribers can go to D-A-Y-B. Go on the terminal. Coming up, the CEOs of NVIDIA and Dell discuss a new AI-powered partnership in the exclusive interview with Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow. We're going to bring you that conversation later in the show. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Now, U.S. President Joe Biden has forcefully defended Israel against war crimes charges sought by the International Criminal Court. The ICC chief prosecutor says he's seeking arrest warrants for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar. The U.S. president called the court's decision to target Israel's leaders outrageous. We reject the ICC's application for arrest warrants against Israeli leaders. Whatever these warrants may imply, there is no equivalence between Israel and Hamas. 
OK, joining me now is Bloomberg Horizons anchor Jumana Basechi in Dubai. Jumana, a forceful riposte then from the U.S. leader, U.S. President Joe Biden, of course, to this decision by the ICC. How significant is this decision? What does it mean for Israel? It is a significant decision. The fact that the prosecutor has actually gone out and accused the Israeli prime minister of committing war crimes is a big deal. And it should be said that it is not just the Israeli prime minister. They're also accusing the Hamas leader as well, uh, Yahya Sinwar, amongst others. These aren't the only names that were in the report. And I think it's worth pointing out here that they are looking to issue arrest warrants. They haven't actually been issued yet. Uh, both uh, sides are saying that uh, they, these allegations of war crimes uh, are, are completely unwarranted for. But the reaction and condemnation from uh, Israeli leaders, including Netanyahu himself, came uh, very quickly. Netanyahu was quick to post to X saying it was a moral outrage of historic proportions. That is a quote. It was also met with some criticism from the White House. Biden, U.S. president, calling the decision outrageous. The U.S. Secretary of State, Blinken, saying that they also reject the decision as well. Uh, so it is interesting to know that, of course, uh, the decision, while not yet, it has, got, has stopped short of issuing a full-term arrest warrant, has been met with so much condemnation around the world. In terms of the significance for Israel, well, at this point, it is unlikely to affect the course of the war, but it is a, a, a damning, yet another damning illustration of how much pressure is being heaped on the Israeli prime minister at this point, especially as we've been talking about mm. so much in the last couple of weeks, they're poised to go for yet another attack in Rafah. Yeah, and, and as you suggest, at the very least, it seems a, a knock, another knock to, to Israel's international reputation, it, it could be argued. Uh, Jumana, in terms of the time frame, you make that clear distinction. They haven't arrested or they haven't, I should say, mm. put forward these arrest warrants. We're not there yet. But what is the time frame in terms of how mm. this could unfold in the weeks and months ahead? Right. So the decision now gets taken to a group of magistrates. There are three of them. And then they have a couple of months to de deliberate on the decision. It could take anything from one month to five months. And of course, in the process, we could see an appeals uh, a process also being submitted from Israel and from other leaders around the world as well. Uh, but essentially what this magistrate court have to decide is whether there are, quote, reasonable grounds to believe that war crimes or crimes against humanity have been committed. If that is the case, then the arrest warrant will be issued. But again, when it comes to the arrest warrant, it is very unlikely that member states will enforce this. Also remember that the U.S. is not a signatory of the ICC. So... Yes, an arrest warrant could be issued, but it is unlikely at the end of the day that any of these arrest warrants could actually be implemented should one of the leaders decide to travel outside of their respective countries. OK, Bloomberg's Jumana Pasechi on the implications of this ICC decision. Thank you very much indeed joining us out of Dubai. Coming up, gold and copper trade near all-time highs. We have more on what is powering the rally. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Happy Tuesday. Now, gold is trading near an all-time high as traders focus on a uh, recent optimistic shift in market expectations for U.S. rate cuts. This has copper surged to its highest ever level. Futures in London jumping more than 4% yesterday. A bit of a breather for copper today in the session. Let's get the analysis on what is going on with the commodity space and bring in Bloomberg's Clara Ferreira Marquez, who is in Singapore. Clara, let's, let's start with a copper question then. A bit of a fade to the rally coming through today still comfortably above 10,000 10,500 it had crossed above 11,000 it's up 27 percent year to date does the softness in the copper price in the session today suggest that maybe this has been overrun I think what we're really seeing in copper today is this tussle between the short-term demand and long-term demand so short-term demand really you have the pullback brought about by China's 
pretty unimpressive economy still. We still have lots of questions about the property sector, lots of questions about consumer confidence. The long term, of course, which has been fueling this big speculative run, this push past 11,000 we saw earlier this week, that's really about long term demand. That's really about the energy transition. It's about EVs. It's about ultimately what could be a shortage of the metal. And that's what you're seeing today. The bulls perhaps straining to keep their optimism uh, on the, well, straining to keep it up basically today. Yeah, the ball's straining to keep it up for today, and we'll see whether or not the uh, the fundamental story is there for copper to give it to give it further legs in the days and weeks ahead. On on gold, then, Clara, a, a number of different catalysts that analysts are pointing to, whether it's the central banks uh, buying of gold, whether it's geopolitics, whether it's Fed expectations. What what for you is kind of the standout catalyst at the at the moment for the yellow metal? I think the. Interesting thing that I would point to in, in gold today actually is the China import figures. If you like, look at those figures, mm. they are down quite significantly. And this, if you think about the role that China has played, obviously you have big macro figure, big macro um, push for gold. You have the the inflation, you have Fed, you have uh, geopolitical risks all over the place, all of which should be pushing gold higher. But then when you look at China, which has really been named as the single factor that has been uh, pushing us to record levels, that is looking a tiny bit cooler. So today exports, uh, a few weeks earlier we had central bank buying, also a tiny bit cooler. So that really will be the one to watch. Prices are a little bit too high for the but Chinese at the moment. Mm. OK, that's really interesting in terms of the slightly softer import numbers coming through from China on gold at 2,416 right now per troy ounce. The other, the other element, when we loop back to the copper story, of course, is the BHP bid for Anglo-American and particularly, of course, with the eyes on its copper assets. The deadline then Wednesday. Talk to us about where we stand on that story then, Clara. So we're approaching D-Day, the deadline of the takeover panel regulatory deadline is the end of the day in London tomorrow. So what we're waiting now is to see whether BHP will in the last minute put in a, um, a firm bid for Anglo-American despite plentiful signals from Anglo-American that perhaps it isn't quite ready to engage and certainly not at the current price or whether they walk away for six months, wait and see what Anglo does with its strategy plan, whether it really can pull this off and then either come back with a lower price or, or, or take the, uh, t have a go at buying the rump, the good bits of Anglo-American which will be left and as you said that really is a copper story. Of course going back to, uh, to the, the sentiment that has been fueling the price ever higher. OK, Clara Feria Marquez in Singapore. Thank you very much indeed with the deep dive on this commodity story. We appreciate it with the context, of course. Let's check in on the futures then on today, where, frankly, it's looking a bit soggy in terms of the setup for the European session. Of course, European stocks still close to those record highs. US stocks as well, very near those record highs on the S&P. And the Nasdaq crossing a fresh record yesterday. Currently, European futures pointing lower by three tenths of a percent. It's been a challenge session over in Asia. The MSCI Asia Pacific Index is currently down seven tenths of a percent. You've seen some pretty significant selling over on the HS Tech Index on some of those big tech names over in Hong Kong with the likes of Tencent dragging that index lower, currently down by 3% on HS Tech. The HSI over in Hong Kong down 1.7% and a further reminder of the challenges around the real estate sector in China with land sales dropping uh, to the lowest levels in about eight years as well at a local provincial level. FTSE 100 futures pointing low by 6 tenths of a percent. The S&P currently flat in terms of the lead up. Coming up, how prepared are the world's biggest companies for a world of dramatic transformation. We're going to bring you the scorecard next. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. These are the stories that set your agenda. Stocks take a breather as traders begin to focus on NVIDIA earnings, an event set to test the AI-driven rally. The Fed's Loretta Mester and Rafael Bostic reaffirm the higher for longer mantra in exclusive interviews with Bloomberg. Not five years anymore. JP Morgan boss Jamie Dimon lights a fire under succession talk in America's biggest bank, signalling his retirement is closer than ever. 
Plus, NVIDIA and Dell discuss a new AI-powered partnership. We're going to bring you our exclusive conversation with the two CEOs. Let's check in on these markets then. Again, the NVIDIA catalyst is certainly going to be there, it seems, for the equity markets. Dropping, of course, on Wednesday. You have inflation as well out of the UK tomorrow. Currently, European futures pointing to losses of three-tenths of percent. A bit of a breather, it seems, for European stocks that are close to those record levels. FTSE 100 looking to losses around 46 points, currently at 8,399. S&P futures are currently flat. NASDAQ futures also in similar territory at 18,752. Let's flip the board and look cross-asset then. With, of course, the commentary from those Fed officials once again reiterating higher for longer. That mantra, of course, ringing in our collective ears. 441 on the US 10-year. Loretta Mester saying that it would be inappropriate right now to go for three cuts, she believes. The dollar is slightly stronger in the session, but a pressure coming through across the FX space then. Bitcoin really interesting on speculation around Ether ETFs and approval there. It is just speculation at this point, but that's powering the crypto space higher. Bitcoin getting a leg up by 2% at 70,944. And copper, currently just a bit softer after that incredible rally year-to-date at 27%. In the session today, down three-tenths of percent at 10,000. 852. Now, Dell CEO says the company is unveiling a new line of personal computers optimised for AI tasks. Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow spoke exclusively with Michael Dell, alongside NVIDIA chief Jensen Huang, and the at the Dell World Conference in Las Vegas. All our new PCs will be AI PCs, right? <laughs> I mean, and the reason is that anything that you're doing that has an edit prompt is going to be sped up because every software developer in the world is figuring out how to use all this new power in the GPUs and the NPUs in these new AI PCs. So, Your processing so, units for the, the exactly. initiated. So that experience will be better. So when, when your PC is now four years old, it's time for you to get a new one, right? You're gonna want the one that speeds yes. up those new capabilities. And inside your company, they're gonna wanna make sure you have that that you know, they, they don't want to buy a, a machine that's going to last for several years that doesn't have that capability. Jensen, where is NVIDIA's place in the AI PC? I, I know you as gaming. That's yeah. again, I grew up with the gaming side of NVIDIA. Yeah. Do you have a place in the AI PC market? Come back next year. There, there's yeah, exactly there are a bunch of bunch of NVIDIA GPUs and Dell PCs, and uh, Dell workstations. Uh, all of our GPUs have the same tensor cores that are running in H100s in the cloud. And so every one of our GPUs use AI to do its work. AI, of course, is going to transform gaming. All the NPCs, the non-player oh, characters, they're going to be Think chatbots. Think about development time, how it will be cut, for example. Creating worlds going to be easier. Instead of instruction-driven computing, it's now intention-driven computing. So it's easier to write programs. Python programs will be even easier to write. Uh, video conferencing will be a lot better because of it. Yeah. But what you did with Blackwell and, and other products is you, you innovated by saying, okay, let's combine GPU with CPU. Is that the next iteration for you in AI PC? You go, okay, here's the NVIDIA CPU that goes with it. We want to support every CPU uh, the world makes. And there are, there are places that, that want x86, we support x86. Yes. There are places that prefer ARM, we support ARM. Uh, we just uh, went to ISC and the top most energy efficient supercomputers in the world are now powered by Grace Hoppers. And so wherever it makes sense, we'll support the right CPUs. OK, the CEOs of NVIDIA and Dell speaking exclusively to Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow in Las Vegas. And AI, of course, is a, a key theme of a new report just released that ranks the world's top corporations on their resilience. It focuses on three sectors, finance, autos and consumer goods companies. The report's author says the top ranking organisations are prioritising innovation to meet the growing expectations of today's customers. Let's bring in at this point then Howard Yu, professor at the IMD Business School for the take on this list, this ranking, of course, dropping today. Howard, thanks for joining us. What stood out to you then in terms of the resilience well, or the lack of resilience across these corporations? Well, competition really heats up these days the way I see it. So it is ever more difficult to stay on top of the ranking. And second thing we notice is across all industry, whether it is FMCG, fast consumer goods, all the way to auto or banking, Every one of these sectors feels like a technology sector these days.
Hmm, interesting. And you're talking, how close is the, is the correlation uh, between, between innovation and, and success? Because there's a risk for these companies as well. They have to play catch up. They have to be seen to reacting, to be reacting to the AI revolution. There's a capex spend there. There's a lot of uncertainty in terms of how you actually implement these models and these products and the layering that goes on, how you get the teams across your corporations to integrate this stuff. There's a risk, clearly. Is there a link? Is there a clear link between innovation and success at the corporate level? Absolutely. But one needs to be careful to keep an eye on the bottom line at the same time. So at IMD, the way we think about becoming future ready is you do a 360 assessment, almost like an MRI scan, scanning patient, but this time is scanning the health of the business. So you need to look at the near term profit growth, revenue growth, cash and debt ratio to make sure they have a fortress balance sheet, just like JP Morgan Chase, Jamie Dimon would talk about. Meanwhile, they invest aggressively in the future, R&D span, new innovation, whether they could scale this new innovation or not. So that's the approach you could assess companies these days. There's a couple of big names that stand out from this report, Howard. I'll, I'll zoom in on, on rather ex unexpectedly, of course, Tesla. Um, look, that t top of the list for you, uh, interesting in terms of the EV space. On some levels, not surprising, but on other levels, it is surprising. We know they've been cutting prices. They're challenging the Chinese market. We know EV growth is slowing. The stock is down about 30 percent year to date. How sustainable is the leadership at Tesla and their ability to continue to invest at this level on things like R&D? Well, your observation is spot on, Tom, because for the last few years, Tesla advantage is just unparalleled. This year, for the first time, its advantage is basically almost completely eroded, except for perhaps AI. What we are seeing in the report is BYD and other car players, in terms of the relative score, they really have improved dramatically this year, meaning the top has been crowded out. The biggest implication is the smaller player, the, uh, the, the lower on our ranking, they become increasingly vulnerable. Because after all, that hmm. EV transition and AI and software requires so much capex investment. If you're not big enough, it's very hard to make that transition. Howard, on, on the EV sector, I mean, how much consolidation do you expect to see, whether it's in China or globally? At, are we at a moment where we're going to see rapid consolidation in this space? I think that's it. Um, I mean, in China, we already see a lot of these smaller EV players struggle big time. Of course, you have companies like e, uh, BYD still surging, but even Li Auto, they just came out from earning announcement, they see their profit plunge. In essence, we are facing the tsunami of industry consolidation. In a few years, you see Solandis emerge by consolidating Chrysler, Borgio, and PSA. That is just a uh, almost like a primer of what uh, is coming in the in the coming years, I would imagine. Mm. In, in the in the financial sector, Howard, uh, you've got Mastercard, you've got HSBC, you've got JP Morgan. You've already touched on them, all, all near the top of the list. What are those companies doing doing right around innovation? Because you speak to some small fintech startups here in London, and they say we're going to challenge these incumbents. But so far, it seems they're getting the mix right. Yes, I mean, it's a mixed message, interestingly, in the world of finance, because I think leading players such as MasterCard and Visa, they really have understood in finance is always frenemies. <laughs> sometimes you're friends, sometimes you're enemy, and you compete and cooperate. What Master Visa, in a large extent, DBS and JP Morgan Chase, they have done right, is to opening up the infrastructure to embrace open banking, to open up the infrastructure so that other fintech innovators can use their existing system to go embed a financing in another situation. So in a way, this is how these uh, you know uh, existing player keep their product attractive. In short, if you cannot mm -hmm. outrun fintech innovator, you let them join your system. Howard, one name that stood out to me from this list in the consumer product space is L'Oreal. And maybe this is my ignorance, but I hadn't expected them to be leading on innovation. But you're saying this cosmetics maker is right at the cutting edge of technology, innovation, implementing things like AI. What are they doing? 
Oh my gosh, L'Oreal is really quite a remarkable way of thinking about selling seemingly low tech product, right? Uh, color cosmetic, eyeliner, but the way you're looking from the digital supply chain all the way to engaging consumer is what the future e-commerce would look like. For one instance, they have this augmented reality app allowing consumer to try out different, you know, hair color or color cosmetic, and they see the conversion rate triple. And then they put this technology to all brands under L'Oreal, whether it's high-end Lancome or all the way to uh, Sephora, their third-party distribution channel. So they scale this emerging technology to engage consumer around the clock to understand what they need before they start creating the next blockbuster. I think that mindset is so pronounced. So yes, you're right. It's the technology company so happen to make mm. hair color, for instance. Okay, a tech, a tech company is selling, essentially selling, selling lipstick. Howard Yu, professor at the IMD Business School. Thank you very much indeed with a deep dive on how some of these big corporates are adjusting in terms of innovation, what they're doing right and what they are doing wrong in some cases as well. Howard, thank you for the analysis and the context. Now, this is one of the stories making the news this Tuesday. UK employers are offering a 14% wage premium for jobs that require skills in AI, staying on innovation, as booming demand for the technology reshapes the labour market. Research by consulting firm PwC show postings for AI roles have risen almost four times faster than the average for other jobs over the last decade. Surging demand is pushing up wages as companies compete for a limited pool of workers with technical skills like machine learning. A coalition of Tesla shareholders is urging others to reject CEO Elon Musk's proposed 50 Six billion dollar pay package. Fifty-six billion dollar pay package. Investors are set to vote on the package at the Tesla annual meeting in mid-June. The rebels say Musk is distracted by his commitments to five other companies, preventing him from serving the EV maker's best interests. And the head of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corp is to step down after findings of a toxic work environment put the regulator at the centre of a heated political fight. Martin Grunberg faced mounting pressure following a scathing report that detailed allegations of harassment and discrimination at the bank regulator during his tenure. The report, after a month-long probe, was based on accounts from more than 500 people. Coming up, Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester no longer thinks three rate cuts are appropriate this year. Our exclusive interview is next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Now, Rafael Bostic, the Atlanta Fed president, has doubled down on the higher for longer mantra. Meanwhile, Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester says three rate cuts in 2024 are no longer appropriate. I was on the record uh, before saying I was at the median, which was three. The developments I've seen in the economy right now, I would not think that that's still appropriate um, because the inflation risks have moved up. It's too soon to tell what path inflation's on, so we just need to collect more information on that. In the first part of the year, what we saw was the risks that we were too restrictive have gone down. You know, last year people were worried about, oh, the Fed may be getting too restrictive and therefore it's going to dampen the economy. Those risks went down. At the same time, the risks to inflation, I think, are tilted to the upside and remain so. And so that's the balance thing that we have to do as we set policy going forward. I do think that our new steady state is likely to be higher than what people have known over the last decade, maybe back to where we were in the 1990s and 2000s, uh, but we'll just have to see anything can happen. My outlook is really that inflation will continue to fall through this year and into 2025. You know, I think that it will take quite a while for us to get all the way to 2%, but, uh, but I do think we'll get there. OK, Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bostic and Cleveland's Loretta Mester speaking exclusively to Bloomberg. Let's bring at this point then Anika Gupta, Director of Macroeconomic Research at Wisdom Tree. Anika, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Is this a market, an equity market that needs a cut from the Fed? 
Good morning, Tom. Um, I think we are seeing interest rate calibrations now, you know, settle in again into markets. I think markets do need to see an interest rate cut. Um, you know, we're seeing, uh, based on the data last week, bad news is again being viewed through a lens of good news because we're likely, given the bad, slightly bad economic data that we had uh, coming out via retail sales and a hotter, slightly hotter CPI print, that's being viewed from the lens of, you know, the giving way to the possibility of an interest rate cut by the Fed. Um, and I think it's quite important because we are seeing um, overall earnings improve in the U.S., but it seems like quite a split market where we're, you know, we're essentially seeing the Magnificent Seven leading on the earnings front, whereas the rest of the market lagging in a way. And so this interest rate cut would be quite beneficial for um, equities going forward, especially given the fact that we started the year with such a strong, um, you know, expectation of more than seven cuts. It then got dialed down to virtually none. And now we're seeing two interest rate cuts being brought back onto the table. Yeah, it's from, se from seven to, to just shy of two, markets pricing in about 40 basis points or so uh, currently with the first one locked in for, for November. Anika, if, with the dot plot revisions that come through in the next week or so from the Fed, if we go from two to one, is there a sensitivity, is there a vulnerability ac across the stock market and which parts, of it, which parts of the equity space would be vulnerable from a move from two to one? Yeah, I think it's going to be the cyclical parts of the market that will be most sensitive. Um, you know, most of the technology names, the growth oriented stocks would uh, get impacted if we see it, uh, if we see those interest rate expectations revised again, because there's been tremendous amount of interest rate volatility. Um, so to see that being revised again would, uh, you know, imply higher yields. And those higher yields are going to, you know, press on and put uh, under pressure those longer duration uh, equity um, uh, set parts of the market. Mm. What, what, what are you seeing in terms of that valuation gap between Europe and the US? Does that, con does that converge further? Is that, is that supportive for European equities in, in the quarters ahead? Absolutely. You know, we're, we're at a point where European equities have outperformed the US. Um, we are seeing that legacy valuation gap uh, now begin to converge. You know, since 2008, the financial crisis, we've seen U.S. equities really outperform European equities. Uh, this has been a remarkable year where Europe has, uh, you know, uh, done much better. And uh, this is really on the back of a better economic footing. We've seen improving economic data in Europe uh, coming through. We're also seeing, uh, you know, the expectation of interest rate cuts uh, the interest rate cut cycle beginning in June and, and taking fruition by the ECB. Alongside that, we're seeing, um, you know, a better earnings distribution. So now we're seeing European companies increase their share of buybacks. And that is, again, enhancing returns uh, for investors in Europe. And I think more importantly, you know, this valuation gap, not just between the US and Europe, uh, but other uh, countries geographically, even if you bring in Japan into the into the mix, uh, we are seeing investors globally now want to diversify uh, their exposure. And hence, it is benefiting other geographies such as China, Europe, as well as Japan. And we've seen that play out in 2024. OK, so that diversification theme. I wonder, I wonder if the NVIDIA earnings that drop on Wednesday are going to change that and, and it all just gravitates back, back to the US if they come through with a strong beat. Uh, how, how important is NVIDIA for, for, for this global stock market? I think it's going to be very important, Tom, just given the size uh, and the sheer weight of NVIDIA in the S&P 500, NVIDIA within the Magnificent Seven, um, you know, the, the buzz around AI, its long-term implications, as well as the short-term implications. Uh, so the market is waiting on, you know, it's on tender hooks in terms of how these results actually play out. If we do see a beat uh, transpire again uh, in NVIDIA's results, I think that's going to set off some very positive momentum for the tech space, which could offset, you know, some of that risk that you mentioned of whether we get um, a downplay in interest rate expectations mm. from two to one, it could offset some of that negativity um, and, you know, provide that positive momentum to the MAG7 and hence further spur that equity market rally that we are seeing in the U.S. Uh, play out this year. Okay. 
Anika Gupta, Anika Gupta, Director of Macroeconomic Research at Wisdom Tree, on the importance of those NVIDIA results and the valuation gap uh, between Europe and the US and how that could prove uh, supportive for European stocks in the quarters, uh, uh, weeks and months ahead. Uh, Anika, thank you very much indeed. There's plenty more coming up. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. So Anika Gupta from Wisdom Tree talking to us in the last few minutes about the importance of those NVIDIA earnings that cross, of course, on Wednesday out of the US in terms of the potential catalytic effect. I'll get that word out eventually. In terms of these global stock markets, global, not just the US, but the importance, of course, of those NVIDIA earnings. And maybe if they come through with a solid beat, it could put aside any concerns about whether or not the Fed goes and how many times the Fed goes. Here's the sales picture going back then to 2018 for NVIDIA as, of course, they've made that pivot from gaming GPUs to the GPUs that underpin these NVIDIA or these AI models and the sales strength that has just powered through. $265 billion in terms of the revenue on the sales front. Can they continue that pace of growth or is that growth starting to slow? That's the importance of the earnings story in NVIDIA and it ties in, of course, to your views around the S&P more broadly, US stocks more broadly, at a time, of course, when JP Morgan Skolanovic is the only prominent bear that remains. And this this is his target still. He's looking past the AI effect with a target of 4,200. 4, That's a 20% gap that we're talking about from currently at 5,300 on the S&P. You had Mike Wilson reversing course yesterday. He's now targeting around 5,400. Goldman Sachs essentially says there's barely any more upside to come through for the S&P. But the hawk that is JP Morgan's Klanovic is still there expecting that 20% drop. Of course, he got it wrong last year and he got it wrong the year before as well. He was overly um, bullish last year and overly bearish uh, the year prior to that. But nonetheless, that's his view and the standout. NVIDIA, NVIDIA, of course, and the AI effect. He says there's geopolitics at concern. There's a risk around the consumer being squeezed, the inflation, the higher for longer. Those are all on his list of concerns. There's plenty more coming up. We're going to speak to the CFO of AstraZeneca on the company's once-in-a-decade capital markets today. That is... Next hour on Markets Today, plus the president of the European People's Party is going to speak to the Pulse ahead of those upcoming European parliamentary elections. Up next, it is Markets Today. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> 